$5,000. Florida courts in the crosshairs. A growing lack of confidence and trust in our courts and system. A flood of advice to the state. This consolidation plan reeks of judicial gerrymandering. Local officials make a hell of a difference. And I would argue that this entire request feels very political. If the circuits become any larger, it will be impossible for us to do our duties, to reach out to our citizens, and to adequately represent our law enforcement. A plan to merge the circuits following state attorneys taken out by the governor. I am your duly elected state attorney and nothing done by a weak dictator can change that. Fears of politics at play. <laughs> Senator Rick Scott gets another opponent. I can sense that this state is ready. It's ready for new leadership. Can DMP deliver his first state defeat? <laughs> and breaking this morning. <laughs> racist with a weapon. Let me put. The shooting was racially motivated. A lot on the plate for today's roundtable. The big news of the week live this week in South Florida. Good Sunday morning. I'm Glenna Milberg. Unless you are plugged into the world of courts and criminal justice, it's a good bet you do not yet know that the state is considering merging some of Florida's 20 circuits or why that matters. But you will now. That's why we're here. The House Speaker advanced that idea. Florida Supreme Court Chief Justice convened a committee to hear input, and that committee did Friday in Orlando. About 50 speakers all told them some version of, please don't do it. That followed a flood of letters like you're looking at right here saying the same thing. The speaker had outlined the idea as a way to save money and be more efficient and more standardized prosecuting and defending criminals and judging cases. Remember, all those who do those things, state's attorneys, public defenders and judges, they are all elected by local voters, you. So you start to see why a state move to rearrange things can raise concerns of political maneuvering. Add to that the Republican governor, who is now suspended and removed two of Florida's Democrat state attor state's attorneys. Does the state need better and more efficient criminal justice circuits? And is the way to do that merging them to fewer and bigger? Or are there other intentions at play? Two people on the front lines of it all are here to talk about that. Miami-Dade Public Defender Carlos Martinez and Monroe County State Attorney Dennis Ward. So good to have you both here in-house with us today. I know this is kind of, people are gonna say, well, what is this process? But this is huge, and I feel like we are right at the ground level, and I'm so happy that we can talk about that. So you're on that committee. You were both, both there in Orlando, right? Yes, we were. Carlos, you're on the committee, and this is sort of this consolidation practical matter why like what what is happening here uh, so the information that representative Renner uh, gave the court That's the house speaker the house speaker that initiated this process uh, he was essentially looking at trying to see are there some efficiencies that can be gained with consolidation and other aspects of that and then the court they have certain rules to follow and part of the rules is to appoint a committee to look at these things. So this is, we're watching the cogs of bureaucracy move. You know, it was interesting, Dennis, I, I just want to point out, you are a Democrat, you are a Republican. Right. And I want to make that clear because there is a perception that this is a partisan process somehow. And we'll, we'll get into that. But <laughs> what was very telling to me is uh, so many people in your world are, are well aware of what's happening, but it hasn't really bubbled up into the public consciousness yet, and a lot of people just don't want to talk about it. The people who know aren't talking. Why? Why, why is this so sensitive? I think there's a, a, a fear factor involved. Um, you know, you see two state attorneys removed from office, and you know, there, there's other state attorneys that are saying, well, am I next? Uh, fortunately, we have good statistics, and uh, we, we have uh, a good state attorney's office in the Florida Keys, as far as I'm concerned. But because I, you're the head of it. <laughs> of course. But I have good employees and I, and I have good constituents. And, and a lot of people are, are, are concerned about it down there because the Florida Keys are the Florida Keys. And there's so many things that we value down there. I mean, just to start with our fish and our lobster and what have you, and, and the penalties that, that, that we, we enact and bring to court and uh, try and keep people from coming down violating those laws. And then the safety of the community. 
the safety uh, of the community is of utmost importance, and people have lived there all their lives or moved there because of the safety reasons. So there's a number of factors that get involved there, but I think a lot of people that have found out about it in the Florida Keys have responded. There's some surveys out there. I mean, they're kicking butt on those surveys. So to, just to sort of take that and run with it, the Florida Keys circuit, 16, number 16? 16, yeah is the smallest in the state. That's correct. 11, which is Miami-Dade, and, and Broward, too, is one of the largest. But yeah. Miami-Dade and the Keys would be, if, if I were going to merge a couple of parts of the state, that would kind of be the logical conclusion, which would mean everything that goes on in the court system would shift likely to downtown Miami, which in Key West would not go over really well. But uh, we were talking, and, and you brought up something really interesting, all the elections. How does, a, how does a judge or a state attorney or a public defender in the Keys get elected when you're merged with Miami-Dade where all the voters are, right? And that's exactly the concern that has been raised throughout the state. Uh, and in Miami-Dade uh, and, uh, and the Keys, in talking to folks from the Keys, their major concern is that all of a sudden there's no way you would get a circuit judge, a prosecutor, or a public defender elected from the Keys in that massive a circuit. So do you think, as someone on the committee who sort of has this overview, do you think in the uh, central and northern parts of the state where there are pretty small circuits also, would they have the same concerns? Uh, the concerns that we've heard, and by the way, I don't speak for the committee of right course. here. Of course. I'm just speaking as the elected just public stuff. defender <laughs> in Miami-Dade County. Uh, but the concerns have been brought up through the entire state. I think some of the mo most powerful comments uh, we heard on Friday is from the prosecutor from the Third Circuit, which is one of the smallest circuits. And his concerns are the same things uh, that Dennis was talking about, which is the loss of influence and having the elected officials so far away from the citizenry. So when you had this committee meeting, and this is the third, I think, but the first where you discussed this, is that right? Uh, it, no, we've been, we, we've been having and discussions. And we're just looking at it now. This is crazy. This was just public input. There are two meetings that are going to be public input. Uh, okay, so public yeah. input it's was, by and large, you were there, overwhelmingly no. Absolutely. There wasn't one speaker that came up and said anything positive about consolidation. As a matter of fact, most speakers uh, recommended expansion. Which would kind of be the logical thing if you're looking for efficiency. Right, and I know Carlos has some statistics on, uh, on expansion and, and how we uh, compare to other states. Right, Carlos? Yeah, so, uh, so some of the things that the prosecutors did, which was really powerful, is the prosecutor submitted a letter to the committee actually outlining the current geogra geography uh, of the different states, how many prosecutors they have that are elected, and the population uh, of those states. And what I found astonishing, and I had to write it down because it's so much information. Uh, in Florida, we have 20 state attorneys. Uh, in other states, I don't call them state attorneys, they call them district attorneys. Mm -hmm. So Wyoming, with a population of fewer than 600,000 residents, Wyoming has 23 district attorneys. So, Wyoming, where, Wyoming, Wyoming is smaller than Miami-Dade. It, it, my, Wyoming is smaller than many of our, uh, of our circuits in the state of Florida. And they have more. So, so they have more. So when you're looking at these things, and the committee is accepting all this information, so if the public has any information that they want to provide to the committee, uh, there is... Oh, we'll put that on the website. Perfect, yeah. perfect. We can't, we don't do, the television doesn't okay. really lend itself that, but we'll absolutely get that so out there. So it's definitely important for the public to participate in the survey yeah. and to actually submit information that it would be important for us to consider. You know, I, I looked up some of the uh, criteria that the committee has to look right. at and efficiency, access, and public trust. And listening to you, efficiency, public access, and public trust lends itself to the keys stay the keys and Miami-Dade stays Miami-Dade and Broward stays Broward. Well, Correct. What is, what is the question here? I was trying to kind of wrap my head. Uh, Why was are one, we doing this? That, 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 was, that was my question. <laughs> my question to, to, to uh, my fellow state attorneys was, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? And some people said, well, you don't know, you don't know. There's, it's because of Andrew Warren and Monique Worrell. The and, two state attorneys that the right. governor suspended. And there's a, a, a train of thought, a school of thought, that they're trying to change those circuits to prevent them from running in 24 and getting elected again. 
You know what? I want to. We have to take a break uh, mm -hmm. right now. Um, that kind of segues into the politics of this, and we will explore that when we come right back with Dennis Ward and Carlos Martinez after a quick break. <laughs> We are back with Miami-Dade Public Defender Carlos Martinez and Monroe County State Attorney Dennis Ward. We are talking about consolidating judicial districts, which is an eye-glazing term for a really important thing underway. Um, and just to wrap up a little bit of the conversation from the last uh, segment, the efficiencies that the state is looking to achieve, uh, what would be more efficient than jamming a bunch of circuits together. So right now, the biggest inefficiency that we have in state attorney offices and prosecutor offices is the low salaries that we're paying for starting mm -hmm. salary and for keeping people. So what happens is the, there is turnover. I lost 45 attorneys last year. 45 attorneys. Kathy Rundle lost 120 Wow. Uh, attorneys last year. And what happens then, you're churning the cases, which causes delay. It causes victims to get tired of waiting for the case to go to court. So in terms of efficiency, if we want to address efficiency, we need to address the starting salaries and the salaries for attorneys who are here in our offices so they stay. That's a, that's a, a huge issue, I think. That we that's another issue. Before, that's yeah. a, cost, a whole cost of living, and you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I'm down to 11 attorneys. I usually have 18, right? And so at one point, I had seven attorneys, right? And the... Attorney General Moody sent me some statewide prosecutors to help me through a few months there. And now we're back to 11, but. So maybe this committee should be looking at salaries and not consolidating districts. Oh, for another time. <laughs> we're not charged with that. <laughs> I know, I know. You know, I want to, the, the elephant, not in this room, but in this issue, and I've heard it from a lot of people that we actually invited to be here with us today who will yes. talk all about this issue, yes. but did not want to do it publicly, is what Correct. you just touched on at the end of the last segment, Correct. is That's that true. there is real fear in when, what I call the opposition, which in this state at the moment is the Democratic Party, and all the Democrats are fearing they've seen two Democrat and elected state attorneys removed by the governor for his reasons. Um, and they fear that this is a way to consolidate the state for a political takeover of the criminal justice system. Not my words, repeating what I've heard. What do you think? I, that's certainly, a, I think, a very valid argument. There's no question about it. Uh, and I, I believe that one of the things that is, is so strange about this is the lack of knowledge that anybody else in state government had about this whole issue. We had uh, Senator Thompson appear, correct? Uh, yeah, and she's on the Judiciary Committee. Senator Geraldine Thompson on right. the Judiciary Committee. Not one word, not one word has been delivered to her committee regarding this thing. And you were saying uh, Attorney General Ashley Moody That's didn't correct. know. She had no idea. And I called Dan Perez, the Speaker-elect, I guess. At Miami and, representative who will correct. be Speaker of the House. And he had no idea either. What your committee? What do you make of that? But had that is so, that normal? Uh, so the I've never been on a statewide committee like this. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so so I can't speak about that. But I can tell you, uh, what is going to be extremely important is that the general public knows what the process is. Right now, the committee's looking at it. Our deadline: we have to submit the report by December first. Then it goes to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court decides what report or what order they're going to give the legislature and the legislature decides. So this issue where right now we have it in the courts and the courts have to be neutral and partial, that's why we're getting as much data as possible. Once it moves to the legislative process, which is a inherently political process, that's where a lot of these issues are going to surface even more. So the fact that this is a political process in your committee, it's a bipartisan committee. The legislature is a supermajority Republican. The state Supreme Court is a Republican leaning court. It gets to the legislature who the most important people who will see it first there don't even know about it at this point. Does that give weight to an argument that this is not a political process? Well, I mean, you, you, you can make that argument. 
<laughs> you can make any argument. I know. But, but what I'm do you not, think? I, I, <laughs> I'm not going to make that argument. But one good so thing. So you think because you are a registered Republican, correct. and I love having someone sitting at the table with us who will speak truth to power, and in a very holistic, bipartisan way, talk about what's good for the state. Well, we, what's good for our court system? Yeah. Our court system. I think the people are the closest in all of government to our court system. And if, if you lose confidence in your court system, then you might as well pull the plug on the, on the whole uh, operation. And pub public trust is actually written down as one of the criteria. It's yes. one of the biggest criteria. Uh, the fiscal issues are really just a small criteria, uh, but public trust is a really big issue. So is efficiency. Uh, and what inefficiencies are going to be caused by this? You know, the, um, the executive orders with which the governor removed the two state attorneys, there, there are different reasons, but they boil down to the basic common denominator of the governor did not think that the state's attorneys would be doing their job following Florida law. Basically, that's what the bottom line was. Mm -hmm. And yet there is great discretion for prosecutors and a state attorney when it comes to prosecuting, is there not? Yes, there is. And in, in your view, how has that now entered the political realm? Well, I, you know, I, I, I don't look at other state attorneys and how they're running their, judge, their, their jurisdictions. You know, I, I, I look at mine and none of the other state attorneys do that. Well, right. presumably, though, if there's a uniform system, whether you look at them or not, everybody's supposed to be sure, doing the same thing. Sure, sure. And, and there's different issues in, in different uh, circuits. Like in yeah. my circuit, you know, we get defense attorneys coming down from Miami and they're like, this lobster, fish? I mean, <laughs> yeah, but when you see lobster and fish as big as your finger and these guys got a bucket full of them. I think we have reports on people busted for illegal lobstering. Right, and, <laughs> and with fentanyl, we've got five yes. people in, in, in jail right now that we've charged with homicide. And a couple of them that we've gone to the grand jury to get first degree murder indictments. Um, our, our police officers were getting battered down on Duval Street and we, I, I told my prosecutors we need jail time in those cases. So there right? is discretion. Sure, I mean you, you run your office the way you run your office. Always looking at the statutes and procedures. And is that discretion part of the committee hearing process? No, no, it, no it's not. Un unless it falls into one of the criteria and if it falls within one of the criteria, it's mostly looking at uh, what sorts of things are different prosecutors doing or in the courts. For example, uh, there are many courts in Florida that have mental health courts, drug courts, and veterans courts. Yes. And then there's a serious concern that's been expressed already. What is the impact going to be if all of a sudden you expand the jurisdictional boundaries is everyone in that circuit going to have access to that? So you had mentioned before that public input is so important. We are going to have on our website, following this program, we'll get everything on so people can look. Uh, Carlos Martinez, Dennis Ward, so appreciate your time coming in, your expertise, and I know you will keep in touch with us as this goes on and uh, really facilitate the public getting involved because it sounds like that's going to be a game changer. We need the public yeah. to be involved. 100%. Absolutely. Thank and it's, it's not a partisan issue. Not a partisan issue. Thank you for all. having me on. We Appreciate spread the love here. We are bipartisan and all Thank partisan. you so much. All right. Take all right. care. All, all right. right. Up next, we take this all to the roundtable. Stay tuned. It is time for our favorite roundtable. So some introductions really quickly. Rafael Yanni is a Miami-based attorney and political analyst. Melba Pearson, back with us, a former prosecutor, then ACLU, now Director of Prosecution Projects at FIU's Gordon Institute. Tom Hudson is back in South Florida at WLRN from DC as Senior Economics Editor and Special Correspondent. And back with us, veteran roundtable and veteran South Florida journalist Mark Caputo, National Political Reporter at The Messenger. And we have a lot of fancy camera work going on, did you see? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so great to have you all. Um, a couple of, couple of attorneys at the table. So I'm going to start with uh, Raphael. You listened to this segment. Did you know about this move to consider consolidating the judiciary? Yes, it's been a topic within legal you circles. You know things. I, thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm going to take that, put on the resume. Thank you. <laughs> I'm done. I'm, That's I'm your done headline. Today. I know stuff. I know stuff. What do you, uh, which, you, know, you, you know, you are a Republican. I'm a, Repu I'm a registered Republican. I'm a moderate. Uh, I know you're going to get a lot of hate mail saying I'm a rhino. I don't get hate let's, mail. We just do the love here. Let, let's, bring, let's bring in the love then. I wish we were spending the time, instead of talking about reducing the judicial districts, into talking about how under-resourced the existing districts are, specifically in cost of living. 
Um, the I think public, we talked about that a little bit. You spoke about it a little bit, but the public defender and the state attorney in Miami-Dade County, Kathy fernandez Rondo and Carlos Martinez, uh, are very vocal and they lobbied the legislature. There was a minor increase in the grand scheme of things. When you look at the cost of living, the best attorneys that are coming into South Florida on either side, they cannot afford to live in South Florida unless if they have independent sources of wealth or are willing to be starving artists pursuing justice. Tom, that's going to be your wheelhouse a little Listen, bit. Listen, every right? industry is, is trying, to, trying to handle this affordability crisis. And it's not only uh, 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 isolated to Miami-Dade County, it's in Monroe County, it's Broward County, Orange County, uh, Tampa Bay area is affecting this as well. I think the question that, frankly, the public needs to be asking regarding the consolidation push is, how does this affect the delivery of justice? How does it affect the efficient and fair delivery of justice in I, the I state think, of Florida? Right, and that was actually a benchmark question that they have to answer. You, you were in that system, Melba. Yes, and I resembled the starving artist comment because <laughs> when I first started at the office many moons ago, um, I was starting at $38,000 a year. And, you know, it, I'm not going to ask Plus you what gross, year that was, pay. but that would have been context. I mean, the year and the salary. So this was I mean, my first job was $11,000 a year. Talk about starving artists. <laughs> so, yeah, this was around 2002. Yeah. Right? And so now starting salaries are around 60, 65, but if rents are three, $4,000 right. a month, yeah. it's it's not doable. And that, that's, but, a, that's but, a, an industry wide, you know, middle income industry wide South Florida issue. Yeah, but, politics into the frame. Well, in the yes, game of politics, yes. like, well, you're now making the point of the Republicans are pushing this. Mm -hmm. You see, everything's so expensive, we're going to save money, and we're going to collapse all the, the distance. Are they really going to save money? They're is not this? Save oh, money. I'm just saying what the argument is. It's not <laughs> sure, true. They're doing argument, this so right. that they can increase their political power and dilute those few Democratic areas. Right. As Dennis Ward had pointed out, you had two Democratic prosecutors who've been suspended, one in Tampa and one in Orlando. If you broaden out the voter pools, you by nature make those kind of more conservative. You're going to start bringing in more exurban and rural areas and thereby it, it's they won't get elected. It's literally gerrymandering. Yes. Gerrymandering right. by another name. Absolutely. And for another for another reason. Absolutely. Because if you think about the case of what happened with state's attorney Monique Worrell, right? Mm -hmm. She won her district, which is Orange County, Osceola, yes. sixty six percent mm -hmm. of the vote. Yes. Right? So let's say she's already been removed. I have my very strong opinions that have been very vocal on that, that that is shocking. Wrong. That is so shocking. Very <laughs> shocking, very <laughs> shocking. But again, it's an attack on democracy and the voters, because the voters put her there. The voters should be the one to remove her if they think she's not doing a good job. But she is going to be running again come 2024. Suppose, just walk with me on this one, suppose they decide to fold Orange Osceola into Marion County, a more conservative county that's one county to the north. What does that do to the voters of Orange and Osceola? And now also think about the travel time, just the practical perspective. If you live in Orange County and now have to drive all the way to the main courthouse in Marion County as a victim of crime, as a survivor of crime, as a next of kin, as a defendant, as a witness, hmm. you're not getting easy access to justice. And that's the argument, same in here in Florida. Yeah. If you're in Isla Mirada, if you're in the Lower Keys, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to drive up uh, mm -hmm. the overseas highway four or five hours. Maybe you hit the drawbridge, maybe you don't, in order to get that court time at eight o'clock in the morning. There would yeah. be six drawbridges on that trip, but that's <laughs> right. a but, but that's that's really part of the opposition, total across the board opposition. Yep. Yes, bipartisan in letters, opposition. Yeah, and, and if when, when we give you the place to go, if you haven't found out yet, you'll see all of these letters, you'll see all right. of what, So what do you, what will happen now when the people say no and the legislature gets it? Well, the question is, is whether the Florida State Senate decides to resist this. Behind this is the Florida House Speaker, Paul Renner, uh, he and DeSantis are simpatico. I mean, they operate in tandem. And uh, the Florida Senate is uh, much less independent than it used to be and much less moderate than it used to be. But they have shown more signs of resisting DeSantis. They didn't like taking, for instance, the six-week abortion vote, six-week right. ban on abortion. And there's a few other things. So uh, if this is going to die and it winds up in the legislature, it's going to die in the Florida Senate. And so what then... The, we have right now an elect, a presidential election, oh, right. really, <laughs> in the thick of it, yeah. um, which a lot of people thought the legislature's session that just uh, that just happened really was affected by a governor running for president. Yes, and what primary, do you think primary comes next? politics. Well, yeah. the reality is, 
Um, Governor DeSantis is fighting for the same primary voters that are already loyal to Donald Trump. And so that, that colors every decision because he's trying to siphon away those, those voters. Well, what about, okay, and, and we will, you know, next, uh, when is the next session? In January? January. It's in January, January. January. Right, yes. in the, right in the middle of the caucuses. Like, right in the middle caucuses. of the caucuses. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that, you know, we're, we're right. not out of those woods yet. No, and we won't be for a while. So the, the issue, since you open up the door to the presidential debate, I, I have to say, <laughs> I have to say uh, as a millennial, uh, Vivek, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy was horrific on the GOP debate stage. He is dangerous. His his comments about not, Nikki Haley was the only sober person on that stage. And I'm not on her team. I'm not on anyone's team, but she was the one that called him out because what he was promoting was so dangerous. And I wanted to say this to the uh, viewers, if you're a Republican and you are flirting with Vivek Ramaswamy, you are flirting with danger. You are putting America in danger. His policies against Israel, against our allies, are dangerous and will come back to haunt us in the United States. So, well, you probably have no worry, reason to worry. It looks like Donald Trump's going to win the primary. Right. Right. We'll, we'll see. see. We'll see. Know, With all of his indictments. Worries. Or you get to say it. All, all of them. Yeah. All Likely. We'll see. Did anybody buy a mug with a mug? <laughs> <laughs> mug on a mug? On that note, we, we have totally derailed the roundtable, which is one of the reasons I love it so much. But we want to take a quick break. We have, uh, we have news we really need to address this morning in Jacksonville. So we will with the roundtable when we come right back. In Jacksonville right now, a national focus now on what is clearly an intended racist mass murder. A young man in tactical gear with an AR-15 in a store targeting black people, according to his own manifesto. Portions of these manifestos detail the shooter's disgusting ideology of hate. Plainly put, this shooting was racially motivated and he hated black people. To the round table now, uh, Melba, this is happening now. It is a news item now. It is an instance now. But boy, are there issues here. So many issues. So first off, you need to center the family and the community that is suffering right now. I, my heart and my prayers and my actions, actions go to the people of Jacksonville. Because too many times we hear our politicians say, oh, thoughts and prayers, and leave it at that. We need action. And the reality is, this was a racially motivated crime. There was a manifesto. There's no question about that at this juncture. And the flip side is, where's the governor? Yes, he released a statement, but there is a community in pain. And he is too busy campaigning for president than to come down and speak with the people that are suffering. We have 89 active hate groups in the state of Florida. 89, as per the SPLC. And what is being done to address this culture of hate that's being allowed to flourish in Florida? We see in Orlando anti-Semitic signs popping up all over the place, Nazis rallying in Orlando. Where is the governor on this? Uh, so you cover the governor a lot, mm -hmm. Mark. Um, I, I just want to bring it into like this moment. This man had the means and he had the motive. How do you legislate? How could, what could the governor do about that? Well, I don't want to be so presumptuous as to pr pretend I have solutions to the fact that We're the country the country has too many guns and too many crazy people, and it's too easy for the latter to get a hold of the former. And this is what we get. Uh, statistically, now this is according to every town, the gun control group, uh, states with more gun control have fewer gun crimes, which seems to make sense. So there is some truth that lies in the idea that there needs to be some more regulation. But I must admit I don't know what it is. To Melba's point, after the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting that happened uh, tragically on a Valentine's Day, mm -hmm. within two or three weeks, the Republican Florida legislature, for the first time in my life in the 20 years I've covered the state, met in session and actually passed a gun control law. Uh, they passed a red flag law mm -hmm. that should have kept this gun out of this mm -hmm. guy's hands. Mm -hmm. So we need to find out what happened there. And also they limited the purchase of firearms, or better said, long guns, semi-automatic rifles, to people who are 18 and had to be 21. What's left? Uh, we're going to see. Uh, I don't think anything's really going to happen. So just this week, a bill was filed by a state rep who actually was with us, uh, I believe, last week, uh, undoing one of the components of that Marjorie Stoneman Douglas law. Um, Representative Paul Rudman floated a bill that would take away mandatory waiting periods. Oh. This, um, you know, to, but to, especially to Republicans who are crafting these laws, mental health was really a focus and is still. Mm -hmm. And this man in Jacksonville has a mental health past. Uh, to your point, red flag laws haven't worked. 
Well, but you know, taking that into account, gu gun control is not going to fly in Florida. This is not a gun control state. Far from it, right? Yeah. Uh, the, what, what Mark uh, mentions in terms of the legislative action after Marjorie Stoneman Douglas was historic by any measurement, and it happened after that tragedy, right as a uh, legislature was meeting and really driven by the local legislators who brought in their fellow legislators from outside the South Florida area to come see mm -hmm. the aftermath of mm -hmm. gun violence. And in fact, uh, uh, Representative Moskowitz, now Congressman Moskowitz has done the same with, uh, with congressional leaders as well. And I think the further away we get from that kind of tragedy, this tragedy in Jacksonville happening on the fifth anniversary of a previous mass shooting that happened in public, happening on the anniversary of the March on Washington mm -hmm. from 1963, uh, it, it, it will continue to be a uh, rallying point for both political sides. And also, too, it is the 60th anniversary of Axe Handle Sunday, Ooh, which was Jackson. an attack in Jacksonville, which was an attack on a group of African-American people by Ku Klux Klan members. And the police only intervened when another group of black people jumped in to support the people that were being harmed and then, of course, only arrested the black people. So I, I wanna, keeping that in context too. Yeah, no, that is that is context. Um, and I want to sort of merge these two, and I throw out a question to you all here. Is racism a mental health issue? That's a deep question. Ooh. That's uh, what we're I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to pretend to be an unlicensed uh, you know, mental health uh, professional. I will say that racism can be taught, and racism uh, and anti-racism can be taught. Uh, growing up in a Cuban-American household, my father told me that he was shocked when he came at 15 years old in the early 60s from Cuba and would see two water fountains. Mm. My, my father told me that as a, as a young kid. That it made no sense to him, you know, because that's not the reality he grew up with in Cuba, in, a, in an integrated neighborhood. So when I, when I ask that question, it goes directly toward this, this man in Jacksonville has a mental health past, should never have had a gun. Has nothing to do with gun control, it has to do with people with mental intervene. health issues. Mm -hmm. But is, is racism and hate a form of mental deficiency? No, because I, I think, first of all, when I think of mental health, I think of you know bipolar, I think of schizophrenia, I think of actual diseases that you need to take medication, you need therapy, you need you know active participation by a medical team in order to ma you know manage and live with this, right? Racism, you know, you know, much to my friend Rafa's point here, it's just like. That is something that is taught and you can learn and you can unlearn it. And it's a conscious choice, mm -hmm. right? Like you can choose to associate with people that are not the same as you. You can choose to have an open mind about others and other cultures, or you can stay in your own circle and keep perpetuating racist narratives. That is a choice. You know, I, I saw some reports today raising the fact that as of July 1st, Florida is now a permitless carry state. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, does this have anything to do with that? I think it'll be part of that continuing, continuing debate. There's no doubt about that the proliferation of firearms in the state of Florida and the violence that we've experienced in this community and across Florida and the community in Jacksonville is suffering now just the latest. Permitless carry is going to be yet another piece of ammunition that both sides will, will lever against each other looking for some kind of legislative regulatory response. Just real quick, and Raphael reminded me of how old I am and how young he is. It also reminded me that... We are all ageless here. <laughs> just going to put that out on the table. My oldest but daughter ahead. is 20 and my youngest daughter is 13. They have grown up with school shootings, mass school shootings, and duck and cover drills, or the, the equivalent thereof. At a certain point for the Republican Party, if we're going to talk about politics here, their lack of relative so solutions to young people is going to become untenable and likely provoke or promote or lead to quite a change at the ballot box. I don't know when that will be. I don't know how that'll look. But uh, right now, it's hard to see how this can continue to happen without any real solutions. And yes, I understand there's a Second Amendment. Yes, I understand the complications. But at a certain point, when there are tragedies on tragedies, people want solutions. They don't want just thoughts and prayers. And politics, yeah. I just, we, we covered a scare at an elementary school, right. uh, actually a K to eight, just this past week. And these little girls were calmly telling us yeah. about, you know, they knew full well what to do to follow the code red. Yeah, we, we get we get emails as parents saying tomorrow's going to be a code red training oh. day, for instance. I'm sure you've received those yeah. as a parent. I've received those as a parent. But I think to Mark's point, gun control or gun safety 
is so low on the list of, yeah. of voter right. interest and what is what is motivating any voter, not only in Florida but in the United States, to go to make a choice. Crime is a motivating factor, but gun violence is not. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, sit tight because we're going to come right back. Uh, Senator Rick Scott has a, another opponent, and uh, we sat down with Debbie Mukarsel Powell. That's next, and we're back with the roundtable. Just a few days since former Miami-Dade Congresswoman Debbie Mukarsel Powell announced she is running to take out Florida Senator Rick Scott, she's become the Democrats' unofficial best chance so far. DMP announced via video on social media, and right after, we met up with her in the South Dade district she repped in her one term in Congress. He cuts taxes for himself. The opening salvo. He's gotten tens of millions of dollars richer. Makes Debbie Mukarsel Powell's target and campaign for U.S. Senate clear day one. I can sense that this state is ready. It's ready for new leadership. It's ready for someone that's really going to put them first in Washington. Mukarsel Powell spoke with us in the South Dade Swing District. She served in Congress for a term, courted by national Democrats for her grasp on health care, gun policy, and her life story. I'm an immigrant, a Latina, a mother. Internal polling suggests that story appeals to voters enough for a statistical tie with Republican Senator Rick Scott, unlike other Democrats who have filed. The first term senator and two term governor has never lost a statewide election, but won them all by the thinnest of margins and millions of his own money. Senator Scott now a constant critic of the Democrats administration. Run up more debt and raise taxes. The Biden administration has made the decision to keep our borders open and also Mukarsel Powell today. I see them as an attack on someone that wants to actually put, you know, reduce the cost of health care, make sure that we pass gun safety reforms. No doubt this race will go negative, and it's still open. The great Dwayne Wade. Hall of Famer Dwayne Wade told the New York Times he's been approached to run. I'm all in for Dwayne Wade supporting this race and making sure that we beat Rick, Rick Scott. Dwayne Wade has not called me back. I've been trying to figure out who's running, not running. Heartbroken. Out. Heartbroken. <laughs> He's not so, running. So uh, Debbie yeah. Mukarsel Powell, clearly the odds on favorite, not officially endorsed by the Florida Democratic Party, who cannot, which cannot. Um, upside, downside? Uh, the problem is, is the Florida Democratic Party has been unable to take advantage of some potential democratic demographic benefits in the state by registering more voters, and Republicans have. And so now I think it's a half a million registered voter edge that Republicans have over Democrats, yes. mm -hmm. it's just a very difficult field to play on. Is, do you think, I'm asking you, I hear the answer coming, but you get that next. <laughs> okay. um, is, is Senator Rick Scott vulnerable, do you think? Absolutely he is. He has his 15 point plan. I thought plan. you were going to shock me and tell me something. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? No, but his 15 point plan, which was basically attacking Medicare, which is popular, you know, all sorts of social security net programs, which is which are popular. That did not go well with his party. They didn't want him to even release it, and he went ahead and did it anyway. Which he walked back. And Eventually. he also wanted yeah. to raise taxes, which, again, is not popular with Democrats or Republicans. So, again, if, if Debbie Mukasel Powell is able to connect all of these concepts to the base and get them excited and get them turned out, because, again, yes, there is a half a million, a half a million voter advantage, but we also had a turnout problem. If true. we turn people out, we being the you know, Democrat so, Party as a general premise, which I am not a representative of, but if they're able to turn people out, there's a win right Mel there in the Melba, opening. Democrats have an organization problem in this state. Republicans, this Republicans is, is are Nikki, Nikki Fried is working on it. Well, time will tell. Time, yeah. her, her report card will come in November 2024. But in the meantime, Republicans are extremely well organized. Mm -hmm. Republicans have been putting in the work, as Mark was saying, and doing that voter registration push across all demographics. And that is why Republicans are able to turn out voters like clockwork for every single election, small or large. And next year, let's be let's be honest, Debbie McCarcel Powell has a great personality when you engage with her. She did serve in Congress, retail politics at, at, at its peak. And she's a moderate. And she's a moderate Democrat. Even though uh, she's but not she's, painted, she's painted she will, otherwise. She will be labeled by, by the Republican Party, and she already has been in the past. That's why she did not win re-election, mm -hmm. amongst other reasons. But the Democrats' organizational challenges 
are going to be felt and seen very hard at the presidential ballot because there is the primary. She needs to clear a primary. The, Rick Scott's the presumed Republican nominee on his primary. Getting to November 2024, the top of the ballot is going to have a great yeah. impact on whether she can actually move the needle or not. Rick Scott has been a 1% winner yeah. in Florida, right? He, uh, his, his widest margin of victory was 1.2% against his opponent. So, so he is vulnerable on paper. He is not vulnerable when it comes to organization, when it comes to funding. And that's where particularly that latter point is where the Democrats and former Congresswoman Mercosol Powell really have a significant struggle ahead of them. You know, you know that's interesting math because the, the winning in the margins, the the math on Florida voter registration was much different. Much different. Point. And, and Rick Scott has never been on a ballot in Florida during a presidential election cycle. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so that also will argue to the turnout piece for both sides of it, to the differential that the Republicans now enjoy in terms of registration, and they'd appeal to the NPAs. That's traditionally where that 1% had come from. But now, additionally, uh, Democrats NPAs Powell's broke have to for pull. the governor. The NPAs broke for for Governor DeSantis on his reelection. Yep. NPAs broke, you know, for for Donald Trump. Right. So we right. we need to be. They broke for Scott. They broke for Scott Senator as Nelson. well. So we have to be honest that Governor, uh, former Governor Scott, current junior senator of Florida, Rick Scott, he right now would go into reelection precisely on the back, uh, especially if Donald Trump is on the ballot. Mm -hmm. He will be reelected. I don't know about that because again, <laughs> this is a presidential election. This is going to possibly be a rematch between the former president and our current president, you know, uh, President Biden. So that is going, to, that alone is going to energize people to turn out, especially if they are anti the former president. But to, to, so, to Raphael's point is Donald Trump mopped the floor with Biden in Florida in 2020. He increased and I've seen, his margin of victory. Correct. And I've seen it's nothing, yeah, relatively speaking, right? Uh, and it, and I've, I've seen nothing significant from the Biden operation in Florida, and they have told me repeatedly in the past they see more opportunity in Texas than Florida. Yes. That's they, not a they, recipe Democrats, for investment. Democrats have ridden off Florida. No. <laughs> Democrats have, national Democrats have ridden off Florida. Nikki a lot of them Freed, have. Not all. Nikki not, Freed, not all. Not all, but not all. The, the powers that be, the investment's not in Florida. Nikki Freed's task is to increase those to investments. Reinvest. She's, and to reinvest. she's reinvesting as well. She's reinvesting, my understanding, a million dollars into voter registration efforts and collaborating with different clubs and caucuses on the ground in those communities to make sure the money is properly spent to turn out the pockets that are most needed. So, Thir 30 seconds concerns. left. Take us out with how important is Rick Scott's bottomless money? Oh, very important. I mean, he, <laughs> he wins ugly, but he wins. And it's fueled by tons and tons of cash. That's a good football win. Yeah. Yeah. Mark Caputo, Rafael Yanis, Melba Pearson, Tom mm -hmm. Hudson, you are all amazing. And I value your time and your personality and your sense of humor. And you are the total package. Great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank you. value you too. We'll be right back. To rewatch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, all you have to do is scan this QR code with your phone and it takes you right to the This Week in South Florida section of local10.com. You know you are a big part of this program. Love to hear you on any topic in the news and connect with us really easily on social media. Find, follow, and reach out at Glenna WPLG on Facebook, the platform formerly known as Twitter, and Instagram, and now on threads, we're everywhere. Thank you so much for being here with us. Have a beautiful Sunday. Keep in touch.